Will Jesus set foot on earth before his second coming? I know that sounds absolutely crazy. How is that possible? But Jesus actually does set foot on earth before riding his white horse at the second coming, maybe even a year earlier. And we plan to help you prove it to yourself that he does in this episode, so keep watching. There are all kinds of theories out there, but this community focuses on what scripture says about these things, that scripture interprets scripture. And this video will help you discover where those scriptures are. Now in our last video, we explained that the final year of every seven Hebraic years is set aside for the Lord. It is a year of the Lord, also called the sabbatical year or the Shemitah year. And that year is different from the other six. It is a year when no agricultural work was to take place. It was a year of rest, both for the worker and the land. The 70th week of Daniel is one of those sabbatical cycles of seven years. So the final year of that cycle is a Shemitah year as well. And it is our opinion that this will be the year of the second coming, a second coming that begins with Jesus setting foot on the earth and in which a number of separate events are fulfilled prior to Jesus mounting his white horse and fighting Armageddon. But before we get down to the specifics of how all the events of the second coming are fulfilled, we first need to allow you to prove to yourself that the second coming is longer than a single day, as is commonly taught. That instead, it is a series of events that take months, not hours. We mentioned this in our previous videos, and now we're ready to unpack it and the scriptures that support it. The best way is to prove it for yourself. Let's first look at Revelation 19, the traditional second coming verse. While we read this, ask yourself, why are Jesus' garments already stained red with blood at this point? I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Now the common opinion is Jesus stained his garments on the cross. But is this true? No, it isn't. Jesus wasn't wearing a robe. The soldiers divided his outer robe and gambled for his inner tunic. Jesus was then wrapped in grave clothes and buried. Upon his resurrection, he left those grave clothes behind. Jesus wasn't bleeding in his resurrection body in heaven. And there he was given new white glowing garments. In Revelation 1, John saw Jesus in his resurrection body in these garments for the first time. And he simply refers to them as glowing like heated metal. He never said anything about them being stained at that point. So how did they become stained? If Jesus had stained them with his own blood on the cross, they would be stained back at the beginning of Revelation. So what happened between the time John saw Jesus at the beginning of Revelation and when he saw him prior to mounting the white horse with stained garments? Something obviously happened. Fortunately, this is answered for us in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads the winepress? So Isaiah sees someone with splendid garments that are stained red, striding forth on the earth from Edom and asks who it is. Jesus responds that it's he. And Isaiah then asks the natural question that we're asking too. Why are your garments red? Jesus responds, 
I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Jesus gives us a couple big clues here. His robes are stained with the blood of the unrighteous who were killed during his wrath, during the wrath of God. But when was that? He tells us this wrath started on a single day, the day of vengeance, but lasted a year long, the year of his redemption, which he tells us has come or has begun at this point. Now, this is a big clue. And as we saw in Revelation 19, since Jesus' robes were already stained prior to mounting the white horse, we know that Jesus was striding forth upon the earth, pouring out his wrath and staining his garments before beginning to ride his horse and fight Armageddon. The event, of course, that everyone has called the second coming, but now you're probably beginning to see that it isn't. Let me say that again and let it sink in because almost no one is teaching that. But it is painfully obvious if you just look at the scriptures. If Jesus' robes are stained prior to the door of heaven opening, and if those robes were stained when he was walking on the earth as we just saw in Isaiah 63, then Jesus had to be on the earth prior to riding the white horse of Revelation. Wow! Shocking! I know, but you have just proved to yourself that Jesus walks on the earth before he returns for what most call the second coming. And that is not the only evidence. In Matthew 24, Jesus gave his disciples and us the signs of his return. None of those signs included the famous trumpet or bowl judgments of Revelation. No fire burning a third of the earth, no demonic locusts, no fire and brimstone killing a third of the earth's population. I mean, if the trumpets preceded Jesus' return, they would be signs, incredible, earth-shaking signs. Yet Jesus didn't mention one of them. Why? Was he misleading us? No, he didn't mention them because they come after his return. Jesus is on the earth prior to the trumpets and prior to mounting his white horse to fight Armageddon. In Matthew 24, Jesus also told us his return would be like the days of Noah. And prior to the flood, everyone would be living normal lives. Yet, prior to mounting this white horse to fight Armageddon, a third of the earth is burned up. Demonic locusts sting everyone with the mark of the beast, and a third of the earth's population is killed with fire and brimstone. It doesn't sound too normal to me. So Jesus' return must be prior to those things happening, prior to the trumpet judgments. In Matthew 24, Jesus also said no one would know the day or the hour of his return. Yet in Revelation 16, 14 through 16, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet assemble the armies of the earth to fight Armageddon. They obviously know Jesus is mounting that white horse and returning. So this can't be the return Jesus spoke of. He must come back sooner than that. He comes back on the day he stains his robes, long prior to mounting his white horse and fighting Armageddon. And as we learn in Isaiah 63, it happens on the day of vengeance that also marked the beginning of something Jesus called the year of my redemption. The next question we must ask, is this year of my redemption the final year of the 70th week? The sabbatical or Shemitah year we talked about at the beginning of the video? Is this the final year of the 70th week of Daniel or the tribulation? If so, that would fit perfectly. That is our theory. But before we look at it in more depth, 
consider that you have proved to yourself that Jesus is on the earth prior to riding the white horse to Armageddon, possibly even a year earlier. Otherwise, how were his robes stained prior to leaving heaven? Why aren't the trumpet judgments mentioned in Matthew 24? Why are the unrighteous living normal lives right up to Jesus' return? And why do Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet know Jesus is coming to fight Armageddon when we are told no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven? There are at least a dozen more reasons that the Bible supports Jesus returning prior to mounting that white horse. You can see them in the playlist, The Difference Between the Rapture and the Second Coming, and a link is down in the description if you want to see it after this video. Now, let's continue to examine that final year of the 70th week. Now, in terms of that final year of the 70th week, there are three parallel verses in the book of Isaiah that link the day of vengeance that we talked about before with a year's period of time. Three verses that call this year different things, but because they all start on that same day of vengeance, well, it's the same year. Same year, three purposes. In Isaiah 34, we read, all the host of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts will wither away as a leaf withers on the vine or as one withers from a fig tree. This language, if you've noticed, is almost identical to the six seal language of Revelation 6. Isaiah continues, For my sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. Notice Edom. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Huh, notice Basra. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Isaiah 34, 5 and 6. Notice that Isaiah also mentions Edom and Basra just as Isaiah 63 does. These two verses are referring to the same event that takes place in Edom. The event where Jesus stained his robes. And look at the time. It's the same as well. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. There it is again. A year of recompense for the cause of Zion. It is the same day of vengeance, and it's associated with a year. But in this instance, the purpose of the year will be to pour out his recompense or payback for what Edom and other unrighteous nations did to Zion. And there is a third example in Isaiah to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, Isaiah 61.2. In this verse, we see again that same day of vengeance mentioned, except this time, the year's time period is called a year of God's favor. So this year is three separate things, a year of recompense or wrath, redemption and favor. It's a year of redemption. So who is redeemed? Why the Israelites? who have survived the first six years of the 70th week. In Romans 11:28, Paul tells us all Israel will be saved. In our opinion, this is the year that it happens. In Isaiah 34, 8, we saw this same year is called a year of recompense. Upon whom is God pouring out his recompense? On those who mistreated Israel and the Christians. We call this God's wrath. And finally, we saw it as a year of God's favor, or in some translations, we read it as the acceptable year of the Lord. Who is acceptable in this year? The Hebrew word translated as acceptable is ratzon. And in Exodus 28, we read that a golden seal was tied on Aaron's forehead, the seal of God, which made him acceptable to enter the Holy of Holies. This is the same meaning of Isaiah 61. Christians and newly converted Jews with God's holy seal on them will be acceptable to come into heaven and appear before the Father's throne. They'll be acceptable for the year of the Lord's favor. Now, how do acceptable Christians and Jews appear before the throne of God? There is only one way, through the rapture. 
in the Old Testament, we learn about this coming before God's throne in the book of Zephaniah. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. The consecrated guests in Hebrew, Kadash Kara, means his set apart called ones. In the New Testament, this is called the assembly of his called out ones or the ecclesia. And the sacrifice described is what we saw Jesus undertaking in Edom when he stained his robes. It is the beginning of this one year period with two of the three things that happened in that year being mentioned, the wrath of God and Christians being acceptable before God's throne. In Revelation, these events are seen in chapters 7 through 8. First, a small group of unsaved Jews is granted salvation, the 144,000. They're given that seal of God, making them acceptable before the Holy of Holies. Then, they and all Christians of all ages are seen as a great multitude before the throne in Revelation 7, 9. And the silence before the throne in Zephaniah 1, 7 is what is referred to in Revelation 8, 1. Upon Jesus breaking the seventh seal, silence for half an hour. Scripture interprets scripture. That is how the year of favor, redemption and retribution begins on a single day, the day of vengeance, one year prior to the end of the 70th week. Jesus descends from heaven. Every eye sees him. Then he resurrects and raptures believers into heaven and places them before the Father's throne. However, here is the new thinking based on what we saw in Isaiah 63. Jesus doesn't immediately take believers before the Father's throne. Rather, he lands on the earth and begins to pour out his wrath or recompense on the areas of Edom. He personally begins to punish this area, which happens to be in northern Saudi Arabia, as we saw in Isaiah 63, where it says no man was with him, and as we saw in Isaiah 34. This is where he stains his garments. What will he do next? What are the rest of the events during the final year of redemption, recompense, and favor between the return of Jesus and the day he mounts his white horse? Well, click right here to keep watching because this will be one of the most revolutionary videos this channel has ever done. Or you can click right here to catch up on the whole playlist. Till then, this is Nelson and I'll see you there.